In this video series, I'm planning to take Ben Eater's SAP1 computer, which he built on breadboards, but add a little muscle to its bones. Specifically, I want to take the SAP1 architecture and with minimal design changes, make it compatible with the 6502. I'm going to assume that you're already familiar with Ben Eater's series, which is a great starting point if you're not familiar with this sort of material. Then, expand the design using concepts that he's already elaborated on to make it compatible with the 6502. You only need to look at the comments in Ben's videos to see how well loved it is. This is a childhood dream come true, except someone else is doing the hard part. Comments like this go on for page after page in many of his videos. You can't get much stronger language than this. Ben, I'm at a loss for words, but we'll still try. This is by far the most informative lecture slash demo slash tutorial I have seen on how a computer works. By contrast, on one of my recent videos, a critic said, in my humble opinion, after watching this, I can say that I am learning tenfold from Ben's videos and builds over what's in this video. To which my response was, no problem, but isn't Ben Eater times point one still worth watching? Just want to manage the expectations. This is Ben Eater's breadboard implementation of the simplest possible one computer. It was first described in Albert Paul Molvino's book, Digital Computer Electronics. Now, Ben modified it quite a bit by adding a load immediate command, as well as a conditional and unconditional jump instruction. But the machine is quite limited, particularly because it only has 16 bytes of memory. Here you can see Ben pointing out the architectural features and locating them on his breadboard build. The architecture is centered around this bus in the middle, called the W bus. I'm going to go over all of this in more detail during this series of videos as I make modifications, but basically, the W bus is just eight parallel wires that connects up all the modules in the machine. There's a program counter that sequentially steps through the instructions, but its address can also be changed by a conditional or unconditional jump. We have the main memory, which stores data and instructions, and it has an associated memory address register. We have the microcontroller, or the sequencer, which is a bit like the puppet master. It takes the current instruction and breaks it down into micro instructions, which are stored in the ROM, and steps through them one at a time. I'll go through this in a lot more detail in the next video. We have an adder which is fed by two registers, an A register or accumulator and a B register. This part of the design is usually called the arithmetic logic unit. And finally, there's the output register which is connected to a display. The SAP1 has 11 instructions when you include the ones that Ben Eater added. Loosely, these are load and store instructions arithmetic instructions, and branching instructions. The out instruction is a data transfer from the accumulator to the out register. There are two addressing modes, immediate and absolute. Immediate is actually the data associated with a particular instruction, while absolute addressing contains a pointer to the memory location containing the data. We can summarize the SAP1 programming model with this diagram. We have an 8-bit A register and an 8-bit output register, a 4-bit program counter, and a 2-bit status register which carries the zero and carry flags. We can see the accumulator, program counter, and output register on this diagram. The status register containing the flags isn't shown. We know that there are some other registers in the design though, the B register, the memory address register, and the instruction register. We can add these to our programming model to get an internal model, which is shown here. Now, there are plenty of projects out on the internet where people have expanded the SAP1 design. I personally like Michael Kamprath's Beauty One, where he computed large factorials using 64-bit arithmetic, but I think it'd be pretty cool to add just a little bit more functionality to the original SAP1 design to get it to run some of the great 8-bit games of the 1980s. Let's not forget some of the great games that are being developed now for these 8-bit machines. I'm running these games on an emulator for this project, which I used to get the microcode for the sequencer working. 
I'll do one or two videos later in the series on how this microcode works. But first, I want to get the hardware running properly. If I've done my job properly by the end of this series, anyone who already understands how the SAP1 works should be able to see how it expands to become a 6502. As such, I'm calling this machine the SAP 6502. This is the original 6502 architecture, and this is way too complicated. The SAP architecture with its single W bus is much simpler to understand, but it will be a bit slower. I expect that I'll have to clock the machine at 2 to 3 MHz to get the equivalent performance of a 1 MHz 6502. We're probably going to have to replicate most, if not all, of the registers inside the 6502. This is the programming model for the 6502. It essentially contains seven 8-bit registers. But Program Counter Low and Program Counter High can act as a 16-bit register. We can actually identify these registers in the design. Here's the accumulator, index X and index Y, program counter, stack pointer, and status register. We know we're going to need all of these, so we can start by adding them to our internal register model. Apart from the accumulator, there's an A register and a B register which feed into the ALU. Let's add them to our model. There are two memory address registers, and another pair of registers that look like they're involved in effective address calculation. I'm going to add two pairs of 8-bit registers to the internal model, effective address A and effective address B. Just like the SAP1, we also have an instruction register, so I'll add that to the model as well. Finally, I'm going to use a constant register, which will be 4 bits but sign extended to 8 bits. This will be directly controlled by the microcontroller, and it'll be used to generate 0, 1, minus 1, and the interrupt and reset vectors. I'm going to modify Ben Eater's SAP1 machine by first removing this output register and replacing it with a bank of parallel registers, which includes a constant register, index X, index Y, the stack pointer, effective address B low, effective address B high, and the accumulator. I'm going to replace the adder with a proper ALU. And I need to do this because the 6502 supports add and subtract, but it also supports AND, OR, and XOR. It can also rotate an 8-bit byte left and right. If you're not familiar with the 6502 ALU, you might want to check out these videos which I've linked above. I do a deep dive into the operation of the 6502 ALU. You don't need to worry too much about the automata theory, but it's worth watching the explanation at the start of each video. Next, I'm going to replace the memory address register with an effective address register and merge it with the program counter. These will then point into a 64K block of main memory. Finally, I'm going to increase the micro instruction counter from 3 bits to 5 and expose all 8 bits of the instruction register to the sequencer. This is a high level plan for what I'm going to build in this series, but for now, I'm going to focus on the W bus and on that register bank that we saw. Here's Ben Eater's original SAP1, and we can see the W bus running up the center. Although I've drawn the W bus as a solid object, it's really just eight parallel wires. Each wire is independent from the other wires. Chips connected to the bus can either read the voltage on the wires, and in some cases, set the voltage on the wires. But it's a bit like a crowded room. It only really works if one person talks at a time. Insist upon this launch without confirming this message no, first. Bitch. I will be Chief forced back by the rules of precedence, as Captain, Authority commanding officer, in command, the USS Alabama. Regulations I order you to place the XO under arrest on the charge of Navy regulations. I say again, I order you to place the XO under arrest on the charge of mutiny. Now let's look at what happens when we try and have two devices driving the one wire. We'll focus on W0 for the moment. But imagine there are two inverters, one trying to drive the line to 5 volts, and the other trying to drive it to 0 volts. What happens? I've set up this 74HC04, which has six inverters. I've connected the pin 1 input up to 5 volts, which means its output on pin 2 should be 0. I've set up the input on pin 3 to be 0 volts, so its output should be 5 volts. And there we have it. Now I'm going to connect output pins 2 and 4 together, 
which should simulate these two devices trying to drive W0. So this red jumper wire here is W0. When I connect up the logic probe, it doesn't give me an output. It can't decide whether it's high or low. Now let's check the voltage on this signal. It's around 2.7 volts. If I leave it long enough, this chip will get hot and the smoke may even come out. It's drawing that much current that even the supply voltage has dropped by about half a volt. What I really need to do is connect some switches between these outputs and the W0 line and make sure that only one switch is closed at a time. I've added in this four way micro switch. Both switches are open, so there's nothing on the output. But switch four is connected to pin four. So when I close that switch, the output goes high. Now I'm going to open the switch on pin 4 and close the switch on pin 2. And lo and behold, the output goes low. This combination of a gate with a switch means we can have three types of outputs. 0 volts, 5 volts, and not connected. This is called tri-state logic, and we need to use this when we have a bus like this. Most of the parts I'm going to connect to the bus are these 74HC574s, which are 8-bit positive edge triggered D-type flip-flops with three state outputs. If you want a refresher on how D-type flip-flops work internally, I've linked Benita's video on the topic above. Essentially, what happens with these chips is we have eight input wires and eight output wires. Then on the positive edge of clock, the data presented at the input wires gets latched internally. And if output enables low or zero volts, then this gets reflected on the output wires. Here, watch again for the positive edge of clock. Now, it doesn't really matter what's presented to the input wires while clock's low or clock's high, it's only this positive edge that matters. I'm going to connect up a number of these chips with both the inputs and the outputs connected to the W bus. How do I prevent two devices trying to write to the bus at the same time? Fortunately, these chips have an output enabled, which is pin 1. When this is set to 5 volts, the data still gets latched internally, but it's not presented on the output wires. The output wires are effectively disconnected. Here, the orange duck representing the number 5 is latched internally, but nothing changes on the output. Other devices connected to the W bus are free to set the voltage on these wires. It's as though each flip-flop internally has a little switch on the output. When output enable bar or OE bar is at 5 volts, all of the switches are open, which means the outputs from the flip-flops are disconnected from the W bus. But when OE bar goes low to 0 volts, all the switches close, and all of the outputs from the D-type flip-flops are connected to the W bus. The important thing to note about this sort of bus is that it's up to me to make sure that only one device can write to it at a time. A collection of eight D-type flip-flops is often referred to as a register, particularly when they're connected to a bus. What I want to do now is copy the value represented by this red duck from the lower register to the upper register. I set the output enable on the lower register to be 0, and on the upper register I make it 5 volts. This enables a direct pathway between the output of the D-type flip-flops in the lower register to the inputs in the upper register. Then if we apply a positive edge of clock to the upper register, then the data represented by this red duck gets copied from the lower register to the upper register. Instead of connecting arbitrary registers up to the W bus, I'm going to start to name them. Both the inputs and the outputs for the index X and index Y register are connected to the bus. Now I'm going to connect up some more registers this way. The stack pointer, effective address B high and low, and a couple more which I'll show during the build. I'm doing this build using point to point soldering on a perf board. Starting at the top, I have a data bus interface buffer, which is a 74HC245. Then a series of registers, EB high, EB low, stack pointer, index Y, index X, the accumulator, the A input to the ALU, the B input to the ALU, and the instruction register. 
Now, it should be noted for these bottom three registers, only the inputs connected to the W bus. The output of A and B will go directly to the ALU, and the output of the instruction register goes to the sequencer. Now, I'm happy to use either point-to-point -point soldering or a breadboard for this type of build. You can see a modified version of the SAP-1 that I've built on breadboard in the link above. But I actually want this machine to run in real time. I want to clock it at 2 or 3 MHz, and potentially up to 5 or 6 MHz. I've generally had trouble getting breadboards to go above 1 MHz, although I have seen recent videos where SLU-4 got his up to over 8 MHz. Here I'm wiring up W0. You can see that there's no ground plane beneath it, so it's probably not going to go as fast as a printed circuit board. There's likely to be more cross-coupling between the wires, but it's far more forgiving than a printed circuit board if you make a mistake. This sort of wiring is not for everyone, but I like it for the first build of a prototype. I'm not going to show builds as much in this video series as I have in previous ones, but I'll try and capture the pertinent moments on camera. This is nearly done. In the next video, I'm going to go over the sequencer. So don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Press the notification bell.